thank you so much again for the introduction. Uh, I want to say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you to UXSA for having me and everyone for, for being present to listen to my talk. I'm super excited for being here. Um, I'm most often considered a bit of an outlier in research and health research because I tend to break the barriers. And I should mention from the sort of the first point moving forward that my expertise is not specifically in UX design or anything particularly technical, but I've been working with people in very different ways in, in sort of alternative or let's say analog user experience and especially participatory and co-design. Um, considering that most South Africans don't have access to tech or when we do have access to tech, we don't have access to the resource that facilitates us um, accessing very different platforms. Um, so my experience is in participatory design, in co-design, what that means when multiple stakeholders come to the exact same table from the very design process to implementation process to participating in evaluation of projects. Um, and I do this, and I'm passionate about this because I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in what happens when processes, more than products, are relative to, sensitive to, and responsive to very specific audiences for very specific purposes. So, so my work focuses on how do we hone in and present products, or I would, I would rather focus on processes that people want and that they can also uh, participate and, and design the trajectory of that process. Um, so questions that, that guide my practice is, is how does this process feel? Um, or how does this product feel? Or what should it be? What has worked in this situation before? Is the process situated? And is it responsive to specificity? And, and how do we learn together? You know, how do we learn in an iterative process by coming together, deleting sort of preemptive design uh, to step forward. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in process, um, and, and I feel that products is secondary to processes. And I should mention that, um, I mean, I've heard in, in some of the presentations before, people are particularly interested in emic perspectives and, and anthropology and um, ethnography. So, so my background is in, in psychology, anthropology, communication, and then international social development. And that has led me to, to look at process as, as evolutionary and as adaptive. Um, so I wear multiple hats. One of them is Interfer, which is a company I established purely initially for uh, for legitimacy in practice because I was working on my own and people never took me seriously. People was, who's this guy? Why is he here? Establish a company um, that is focused on storytelling for impact as well as inclusive research and what participation actually means. Um, I then, I'm one, one of the first well, International Welcome Trust um, public engagement fellows, and my work is around inclusivity and transparency. How do we develop processes where everyone comes to the table and our books are open? Um, the Welcome Trust has funded about 17 of us globally. I was the first African um, simply because I kept phoning them every six months and saying, we need to change our structures. And then at the same time, I am a co-director of an organization called the Pivot Collective. And we are interested in what happens in egalitarian relationships and collaborations when we don't hide anything behind the doors. And we're interested in knowledge translation and collaborative knowledge production. So knowledge translation, traditionally in academia, you're presenting things in quite dense PDF documents. It's not accessible to the people we work with. How do we shift that? How do we shift imbalance and power? And then finally, I am one of the co-founding members of Raka Vase, that is a, um, well, an organization um, with a lot of artists and anyone interested that we want to change the face of the city by telling stories about our city in, in contrast to the dominant narratives of what Cape Town is. Okay, so a little bit about what I'll be talking about. So I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit about my approach to engagement and research, which is about inclusivity and transparent design and then mostly about participatory design. Um, I'll then speak a little bit about the kind of projects that Interfer has done in, in the space of mental health and storytelling, and then look at how a reinvestment in oneself and in others translated into us uh, establishing an organization that specifically looks at collaborations. How do we shift uh, the, the perception of collaborations, right? And then I'll look at, in my experience in research, storytelling and engagement, what are the challenges that I face and what are possible solutions? And I feel that a lot of the work I've been doing would be relative to UX and different design processes. So without further ado, 
Um, so my Welcome Trust Fellowship, initially I was working for various NGOs and I found grievance with the way we design processes in health research as well in health communication. It was always us coming to people, um, doing a little bit of research, focus groups, and then designing something. So I grew increasingly frustrated with this process. I then looked at different models. Um, I was particularly interested in what would happen when science or very technical um, expertise and knowledge comes together with I don't like the word community, but it comes together with a cohort of community members that understands, knows, and breathes what happens socially, economically, politically in that space. And then I was interested in what happens with the arts as a medium for engagement and relaying those message forward. So my belief ultimately was, and still to today, is that all of these bodies of knowledge are complementary. They should not be seen as competitive. So how do we develop the table that everyone steps to in a process where everyone is acknowledged for their knowledge base and how do we bring that together in a process that can relay a trajectory beyond our current thinking. I also realize that knowledge is quite biased. Uh, I've been in, in academia for, for maybe two decades and um, what we say is gold, whereas the people that we consult with is not. We consult with them to extract information to design, and I grew increasingly frustrated with that. Um, at the same time, with the idea that knowledge is based, biased, I realized that individual storytelling or narrative, they already exist. Uh, why are we constantly trying to recreate the wheel? Um, and, and for mutual learning, um, and then trying to figure out how do we bring everyone together with voices being heard in an equal platform? Um, my work is specifically focused on public engagement uh, and, and health research. And when doing really dense research, anything from vaccination trials, how do we relay these messages back to everyone that we've worked with in an equal space? So this is the focus of my, my fellowship. Um, and I was awarded quite a significant amount of funds to test this in very different ways. I chose to work with mobilized groups already so that I would not have that devastating exit strategy. I would rather work with people that are already working together and align my funds to them by asking them various questions, such as what has worked before? What do you want to do? What are the primary issues in this space? How do we address that using everything you already know? And how do we bring science and the arts in that way where we could learn by celebrating rather than stick to um, structured traditional pedagogy, which we all know mostly does not work? Um, and in doing so, I'd like to sort of concretize one of the projects I worked with. This was called Art in Health for Impact. And this was a project uh, we sourced funding from, from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, it's a project that was run in India, South Africa, and Botswana simultaneously. The idea of this project was let's work on a mental health issue relative to each space in our own way. So each country had um, individuality of practice. We could do as we do. Uh, the other countries sort of developed uh, and delivered on their project in two months. We delivered in about nine to 10 months because I felt that I want to take a participatory approach and I want to bring together very different people to address something, right? So I started speaking to very, very different uh, professionals in mental health in South Africa, ultimately um, resting with Dr. Renee Nassen and Dr. John Parker that works at the Lentecare Psychiatric Hospital. Uh, we realized that young inpatients in the psychiatric hospital don't often have a voice. The relationship with them in the hospital is pretty much, um, I'm an inpatient, you are my counselor, or you are the person that treats me. So the idea of here, using the, the model on the prior page, was how do we bring in science and scientists together with a cohort of community members and artists? So my thinking was that science is trial and error. You know, it's been tested through decades or centuries, and it's highly specialized, but yet it's not accessible to all. Um, either to learn about mental health or care, you have to access this space, which costs money, and the majority of South Africans cannot access that. In, in, in the Western Cape, we have three psychiatric hospitals, each having a catchment of 2.5 million people, meaning that it's impossible for everyone to get care. We then worked with these young inpatients and our thinking was that they have highly specialized knowledge of what works and what doesn't work. They have lived experience of accessing the hospital for care and going back home, 
where they are treated with amounts of stigma and discrimination that controls their lives. So I've heard stories about, I cannot get a boyfriend, girlfriend, I cannot enter soccer practice, I cannot take a taxi because everyone calls me crazy. At the same time, I've been working for a few years with very different artists and, and mutualists especially and, and musicians. And I thought, what would happen if we brought all these people together at the same table? So in the top right image is an image of the entire cohort of, of persons in the project in South Africa. And I'll just speak a little bit about our process. So what we needed to understand is there was an existing power imbalance in this space, as is everywhere in South Africa. We are a fortunate bunch of people having access to the internet and platforms like this. Most South Africans do not. So with that power imbalance, how do we address this in a way um, where everyone could participate? So we needed to establish a rapport. And I'll go through these rather quickly. So we needed to establish a rapport and we needed to equalize the power. And we did so by um, creating a workshop culture. So it was a workshop culture, which meant there's a way of engaging that is designed by people in this space, no one speaking on top of each other. Because we needed to get to a step of, of having an equal collaboration and building trust. A small example was at the very beginning of the workshop process, I referred to Dr. John Parker as Dr. Parker, as everyone does. By week two, I consciously started speaking to him as Dr. John in front of all these youngsters who were between the ages of 16 and 21. By week three, I said, hey, John, what's up? How are you doing, man? Zeleka. You know, so, so I needed to do that, and that was mimicked by John and others to manage existing power. We then had to look at what are the perceptions, like let's identify perceptions and the values in this space, and let's recreate the, our values as a group. And let's call it a culture, you know. And then uh, after we established and worked through that, we needed to look at how do we create platforms for direct sharing, where communication isn't simply I say something, you respond, clear. We need to look at how do we create platforms for equal communication. And this is where we started using things such as WhatsApp. Uh, we tried to use other um, communication and um, project management tools, but the young adults never had access to them. You know, we were using things like Asana and Slack. We realized it's ineffective. We need to go analog. We then realized that all of us have completely different backgrounds. We, we internalize and ingest information so varyedly different that how do we manage expectations and fears iteratively? Meaning that your current fears and expectations may evolve depending on the process and how do we continue to manage that? So we need to create safe spaces. We needed to continuously be present. My team and I needed to be consciously listening all the time, which is completely exhausting, but necessary. Small things such as we had to get a couch in one of the venue and pull a curtain over there. So when someone needed alone time, you could simply walk away from the group, close the curtain, have a cigarette, chill out, and then come back. So we needed to create these kind of platforms for engagement, which after doing so, we could enter into a space of collaboration. After we entered into a space of collab, we could then look at participatory design. So this was, we, we managed this over a period of maybe three to four months, meeting possibly twice a week, sometimes three times a week, depending on the group. Uh, and they designed this with us continuously. And just to give you an idea, so when we started, the only thing we knew was that we are going to be working with the arts and possibly muriling to engage outwardly. And when I say outwardly, it means outside this group um, around issues related to mental health. In Botswana, um, the group chose to work around hypertension and its relativeness to everyday experiences of trauma. So we experience every day and we have higher blood pressure, but it's that thing that everyone has. Work is supposed to be tough. So we're not sitting and realizing the impact and the cumulative impact on us um, by everyday trauma. In India, um, they chose to look at everyday stresses and how it impacts on, on, on life in Delhi. And they chose to reinvest in, in truck art. So it's parking trucks in the U shape where everyone would participate in drawing out their experiences and how it impacts on them. In South Africa, we chose to work around discrimination and stigma associated with mental health, simply because all these young adults said, 
as soon as I'm seen crossing the boundary to Lentegia Hospital, I cannot escape that. I cannot get a job because someone saw me. So we needed to have inception workshops. This is the basic process we had. We needed to have an inception workshop to build rapport. This is where we did team building exercises where we divided groups with scientists and artists together so that people could force mixing and eliminate this idea of he is Dr. Parker. We realized we're working on street art and we're also working on science engagement and science communication, but we needed to go back to the drawing board and allow everyone to experience different forms of communication using different out different platforms of street art. So we went to Woodstock Salt River, we did the tour, we communicated with the MTN wall right now, the Cape Town uh, Science Center, to look at different ways of how science has been engaged with before, and look at how the audience visiting the Science Center, how they feel once they tangibly um, engage with science. We then needed to enter into a learning and sharing space, and I, I apologize if I'm racing through this, I have limited time. <laughs> So we needed to go into learning and sharing workshops. And this just meant we all spoke about our experience, not necessarily of mental health or well-being or trauma, but we needed to share our stories. Artists, myself and my team and young people alike. And for the first time, the young adults in this space could look at what the scientists, what their daily life schedules are when it comes to self-care. They have zero time. They're working eight to, to six. They get home, they cook for their families, they're preparing for the next day and their clients. They come back, weekends they maybe have a, a bike trip, but there's no space for them to care for themselves, yet they're in a position of care for others. We then needed to look at um, what it is we'll be working on through storytelling. And once we've all told these stories and looked at our cumulative story, we needed to code that story and figure out what is it we're trying to say or challenge in society. Once we reached that point, we had a budget of roughly 60 to 80,000 Rand where the young adults that we worked with, these are the inpatients, they designed an engagement festival on the premises of the hospital, first time it's being done, where anyone living in the immediate vicinity of Lentafia Hospital could come forward. The ultimate idea was presenting a mural. So I, our idea, and I'll jump through this very quick, our idea was to paint the entire outside of the Lentafair Hospital to make it more relative to people for communication. But we realized then that one step outside the hospital is property of the city and the city would not give us permission. Instead, we had a 15 meter wall by four meters high and we painted this because this faced the outside of the hospital. So the story goes, the hands on the far left in the waves is the position that the young adults as inpatients feel. And way in the background, you can see a little lighthouse. So they feel that although the idea of help and support exists, the lighthouse is always faded and they're in positions of destitution. However, occasionally you find doctors and others on this little boat that carries patience, courage, strength, love, and hope. They carry these things with the idea that the beach on the far right was supposed to be Musenberg or Monwabisi Beach, with the idea that these people of care are helping you to reach the ideal beach, you know, where the storm always passes. However, if you look underneath the boat, there's all these rocks which combat your position of care and, and reha rehabilitation. So it's almost impossible to reach that because once you reach the beach, the stigma and discrimination you face brings you back 2.1, which is these hands reaching out to the sea. So, so this mural ultimately spoke about aspirations. Yes, we're facing um, a lot of hardships right now, but the storm will pass if we do this together. And this is what they chose to work with. And, and they designed on the, the, the day of the, um, the festival, the mural was completed. So it was a live painting. And they designed the entire festival from what food is available what kind of uh, activities are present, um, absolutely everything. I wanted to speak a little bit about another process we worked with in early January 2019. Uh, we were contracted by the Philippi Village, which is a business district, to, to create a large mural that speaks around the development of a community. Uh, if you look just behind that wall over there, that's Siangena, which was established, I think, a little bit before, I think, 2010. And we wanted to tell the story of the establishment of this wall. So we entered into a process with 60 people running a workshop for six days. We worked with various local well-known artists 
and we ran everything from how this space was established to um, what the aspirations for this community is if they find support from the business and, and enterprise. Um, these are just slight images for how we treated the process. So what most of you would do digitally in terms of research, we did this in analog form. So we were using things from developing activities to build relationships, from looking at uh, where do we collide in terms of development and supporting each other? How do we maintain an iterative process? Because what works today may not work two hours later. How do we develop communication lines so that we can continuously be reflexive? And by reflexive, I don't mean simply to be reflective of what you've accomplished or where you are, but to continually be reflexive of your position in this process and what comes next. So many people always ask me globally, like, why the heck are you so interested in participation? Why do you not follow sort of the traditional methods? Why are you always looking at alternative models? Um, this is a lot of words, but I thought I would just share some of this here, some of this with you. So I believe in inclusivity and transparency and that we can create greater products and processes that are more relative and sensitive to very specific spaces as well as broad audiences. If we include various stakeholders, including management, including beneficiaries, including artists and designers, and including researchers and the list goes on. I personally value process over the idea of developing products and templates. This takes a lot more time. However, the, the yield is greater. Um, in terms of the Philippi project, we found even though we haven't been active in that space, um, because it was treated very much as a consultancy by the village, we still maintain relationships there. When people see us in the road, they still come up to us and hug us and have, buy us coffee, right? So, so we were interested in process and developing relationships. This model also, it has a story of us and our story versus Interfer developed this for us and they walked away. We're also interested in reducing power imbalance. We live in a country where power and segregation is omnipresent, even though many of us choose not to speak about it. How do we address these issues in our workplace and in our work, even though it's not necessarily about uh, social development? And then my work personally is about how do we amplify people's voice by avoiding creating portraits of people? We're speaking on behalf of people continually. How do we openly access research where people are, the people or the beneficiaries of our research are as actively involved as us for greater knowledge accessibility, relativity, and ingestion? Then we all can participate in the conversation. Um, I'm also absolutely not interested in the idea of traditional development thinking, which is let's fix the problem for them, you know, or we coming in here to support the deep dark Africa. I don't believe in that. I believe that all of us should be active in these processes. Working in this way also sparks con innovation and creativity continuously. So it forces me, my team and everyone else to be continuously reflexive of what we're doing how are we doing it, what is shifting, and how do we continue along that trajectory? We also need to play a larger role in legitimizing existing community practice and knowledge. It's completely viable. That's why research exists to extract. How do we shift that to stimulate dialogue? I'm against tick boxing, as uh, I imagine most of you have felt already. So I wanted to speak a little bit about reinvestment in oneself in relation to our work and those we're working with. We established a collective, well, an NGO, which seeks to look at different forms of knowledge, different forms of research, and how do we legitimize and actively work to decolonizing practice that we presume to be static. So by reinvestment, when we're working with young adults and other people, we choose to reinvest and allow them to channel the trajectory of where we're going. We established a project called uh, Young and Curious, which was simply a space for young adults between the ages of 18 and 26 to explore their own curiosities in terms of design and especially mental health and well-being. And for them to have access to the how of research and how do we challenge that as research. So ultimately they will join our team if they choose. This then, this reinvestment resulted in us working on a global project called Planet Divac. 91, which is COVID-19. <laughs> and this was to explore the experiences of young adults in South Africa, Indian, India, and the UK relative to COVID-19 and themselves. 
the idea was we brought together the big giants of comic writers and comic, comic illustrators globally. Um, so what we're doing in South Africa and well, mostly in South Africa, the other countries are working a bit differently. We are actively running workshops continually with a group of initially 50 young adults. Right now we have 12 where they decide which kind of professionals they want to interview. And they've chosen ethnographers, um, immunologists, vaccinologists, mental health experts, artists. So they interview these persons and then they challenge them through artwork or writing. The project also includes musicians. So we have, local and international musicians. So in each comic chapter, there's a musician, a hidden Easter egg in the comic, which opens up a link to a, um, a mixtape. So I can confidently say really big names have joined the project, not only in comic industry, but in the musicians. Um, and right now I wrote one of the chapters and the chapter was based on misinformation because the young adults were saying, there's so much misinformation when it comes to practice running around South Africa something as simple as 5G uh, relative to COVID-19. Um, so my chapter that I wrote was relative to the idea of how information spreads, whether false or not. Um, that's a little bit on Planet Diva, but it's available for free on Webtoons. So this comes to the challenges that I faced in research for the last 15 years, working in very different countries, as well as in public engagement we are still very much taking traditional approaches. We're looking at engagement, communication, and research as unidirectional. We're doing this to understand you and then send this to the big universities. You know, there's no real direct interaction happening. We're taking a tick boxing approach. If I looked at some of the projects I worked with that I left, when it comes to our evaluation, we said, hey, we need a visibility of 3,000 people online having seen these products. I can buy that with 150 grand, it's ridiculous. We then need to stop looking at engagement and research as separate processes. They need to be considered as didactic processes feeding into each other and continuously evolving. My strength was that working as an external person allowed me the maximum power to challenge and explore seemingly static and normal processes. So I have the maximum power to, 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 to explore, but I have limited power to influence structures in South Africa. I managed to do this outside South Africa successfully, but South Africa is still pretty much not relative to these processes. Then uh, meaningful engagement requires multiple and diverse skill sets. So I can't do everything on my own. I work with a much broader team that has experience in anything from research to facilitation, to videography, filmography, uh, coding, and we all come together to challenge the way we do what we do. Engagement and communication also is not once off. We need to look at this as not cyclic, but as, as didactic, adaptive, evolutionary process, processes. And then the biggest challenge is I've, I've, I've chosen through the organization as well as my company to always work in collaboration so that I'm not fulfilling a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not doing what I think is right because I'm being continuously challenged. However, not all partners agree to this. So not all partners want to challenge existing ways of being and doing. And the lessons that has come about, or the lessons that stand out to me that's relative to UX, is that participation and inclusion has great power for us to challenge the way we, con we have done things, the way we think we should be doing things, and the way we engage with people. Shifting that a little bit produces very different processes resulting in completely different products. So this, this is pretty much about being process-oriented and to be iterative but yet maintain a focus on your product. Um, I've chosen to be completely inclusive when it comes to um, anything from the very design of projects. So I normally, uh, when it comes to proposal writing, I'll write an idea down. I don't like the idea of community advisory boards because it's pretty much tokenistic, but I'll take that concept, draw it out, speak to a cohort of people, and they'll completely change whatever I've said to what is more relative, and I'll just write it in a different form to receive funding. Once we receive funding, we do with it as we need to do, as long as we maintain a relativity, a sensitivity to the space and the process we're working in. Um, I can't preach this enough and I apologize if I'm preaching, but innovation, innovation, innovation. There's always multiple ways to do the same thing and shifting your process can result in monumental shifts in your um, products ultimately. Once again, engagement and research, I cannot stress this enough allow it to evolve 
and I'm speaking to myself more than anyone else, allow them to evolve and allow them to adapt and allow yourself to reinvest in yourselves in relation to others. I'm personally interested in, in co-production, co-translation, knowledge translation, and then and, and how we can present these products differently. So I'm always challenging myself and I've presented research in um, murals, graffiti murals, um, animation, videos. Uh, I don't like infographs. Um, right now we're working on exhibitions, so we're working in very different ways as an intentional way of decolonizing and destructuring and disrupting processes. Um, I'm a firm believer in egalitarian collaborations. Uh, I don't like the idea of using someone for a consultancy. I'd rather bring them in for them to challenge the way everything is being done and for me to shift and change. And those are the basic lessons that have struck me over the last few years. Um, these are any contact details. If anyone wishes to get in contact with me, I'm pretty much open. And thank you for still being here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nabil. Shukran for that. Um, so, I, mean, it, I think there's a ton of information. Um, lots of comments, and I think some, some, some awesome comments for you to review when you have a look at the chat log. Um, but let's jump into the questions, because I'm just mindful of time. Um, so the first question, uh, and that is from Hanali. Uh, how, do you, how does someone get involved in these important projects that gives back and really impacts people? Wow, so, so that's a tough one. I mean, it's an interesting one, it's a tough one. Um, at the moment, uh, we have, I'm gonna try and speak about this very quickly. So we've, we've approached the Welcome Trust for funding, and this is funding to support an existing hub. But what we've written is to shift that and to completely disrupt that. We've said we are applying for these funds, yet we don't want your hub in the UK. We'll use your hub for a UK cohort of, of researchers that want to challenge themselves. However, we want to establish a hub in South Africa, in Cape Town, that is accessible to everyone that wants to work together in different ways, right? So if we, fingers crossed, if we get funding, we will establish a, a large hub in March 2020 for two years. And in that way, we would very much welcome people to get involved. Um, However, you could reach out to me um, if you would are interested in getting involved in these projects. Um, but I would have to let you know that a lot of the big decisions are made by the young people I work with. I present the decisions to them. They present the solutions because I want to maintain relativity to what they need and what they want because they know what's best. So it's a little bit of tricky because a lot of these projects are written in, in quite a big um, proposal and we stick to very strict budgets. Um, but please reach out to me. And if you have something very specific you'd like to contribute, we would welcome you to even for the young people may want to interview you um, for their own learning. I, I know that hasn't answered you directly. I apologize. <laughs> it's a little bit difficult. Um, yeah. So, um, so the next question, uh, and this is from Nicola. Maybe the same to you, um, but how can we collaborate with you? Asking as a designer, researcher, musician, and lover of Bailey. <laughs> please, please reach out to me. Please, please reach out to me. So at the moment, yesterday, the young adults chose to interview a maternal mental health practitioner based in Hanover Park because they wanted to understand what new young mothers are facing in COVID-19. Uh, we realized this was an issue. Um, and then together with friends, we started a project called COVID Mamas. We put out a crowdsourcing campaign. We managed to raise 90,000 Rand and we bought mom, mom starter packs. So and I'm only saying this because we, we maintain a responsiveness to what is coming out. Um, so they might be interested in interviewing you, um, learning a bit more about your specific expertise, how you address problem solving. In the group, we have two people very interested in coding and web design. Yet the problem is, so we, we got them cell phones, we get them data, but South Africa is so, is a word I would rather use, that 
even with these new devices and and data they can't we can't have zoom calls it's impossible south africa is just so stupidly segregated that we can't communicate so some of them actively want this at the same time we are trying to develop a mentorship program where this is this is a small cohort of 12 young people so we figured out what they want to do in their lives and now we're trying to figure out how do we draw a line between what they want to do um, bearing in mind at the moment we have completely limited funds so we're trying to link them with professionals uh, even if it means some of us pay from our salaries um, where they could spend time with people and, and learn about how to get to their goals so in that way nicola we might be interested or if you might be interested in interviewing in being interviewed or coming to our events so we will be establishing doodle nights um online doodle nights or very controlled like 15 people max doodle days um where everyone comes together and we we throw something so if they're interested in, in 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 stigma around mental health so we'll throw stuff in the floor like adhd schizophrenia depression and everyone draws together and has a conversation about what this means in south africa and how do we take this further as a group they are having a um, exhibition in January, and the Zeitzmacher might be hosting us, so we're hoping. And at the same time, we would like to invite others to contribute pieces to their exhibition. So that's another way you could get involved. Thank you for that, Nabil. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got, sure. OK, next question. <laughs> um, uh, we've got a few questions and I'm just mindful of time because it's going to eat into um, the break. So, okay, let's go. Uh, and the next one is from Kate Fanny Kirk. Uh, how much, how much does the, do the historical inequalities and segregation of actual physical spaces in Cape Town influence the experiences and success of creating public art and messages? And did the city of Cape Town put any barriers in your way, speaking as an anthropologist who has done research among young people in Cape Town? Well, okay, that's a, a loaded question. Um, I just <laughs> got a message from someone called Atia Khan um, this morning, that's a journalist, and her, this is actual, uh, she, she's, she's, for the last month she's been writing a piece on this question specifically around how the city facilitates or controls spaces and and how this differs um, within Cape Town across different populations. Um, so coming to your question, which is how much the historical inequalities and segregation of actual space in Cape Town influence, very much so, very much so. Um, I mean, we we with the Rock Vase, we're actively trying to paint spaces, but spaces that are used by people, so NGOs, schools, educators, and we realized that at certain times we've been called out even though we have permission of the, the owners of spaces we were told you need to access the city yet in other spaces um and i don't mean to harm anyone in this conversation but in other spaces in cape town for example in musenberg there are a few artists that are given complete leeway to paint as they choose you know so, so the city really differs in the way it treats citizens from different spaces we as rock base have chosen not to work with the city so we painted spaces all over the Cape Flats. One such space was in Sea Winds. We painted an NGO that trains young people to um, play pool so they can somehow escape um, poverty. So everyone that has accessed this space became a champion, a provincial or South African champion, yet they cannot reclaim their title because the competitions are held in spaces where they need 500 Rand transport to go to Booster, as an example. While we painted that space, we were told, Get your asses inside right now because there was gunfire all around us. So, so that's a, just a little bit like of an example of, of the city has no interest in that space or controlling that space so we could paint as we choose. However, we faced other obstacles which people face daily, right? Um, so, so it's a, a loaded question. I would say, if possible, um, you could reach out to Atia Khan. She's a journalist. And the piece she's writing is specifically on your question. Um, I see Nicola had another question, which is, have you used music as co-creation tool yes. in your workshops? We are trying. So there's a massively beautiful giant you know, uh, known as um, Jitzbanger, Quentin Goliath. He is a beautiful human being. 
uh, I would stand in front mm -hmm. of a bullet for him. Um, in the project on Lentegier, he came on board as a project ambassador. So he took the idea of mental health and self-care and put it on all his platforms. And we were trying to write music together, but unfortunately we ran out of funding you know, to get um, a studio to record. But one of the young adults in our group, he's a beautiful singer. We gave him a guitar, he could play a little bit. When he came back a month later, he could play beautifully. So we, we, we're looking at actively trying to work a bit more with music as co-creation because we've, we've seen the power. We work to establish safe spaces. I've worked into spaces where when music was used, the space was immediately safe when I walked in. So I'm trying to learn how music facilitated the space being safe without going through a deep workshop or a deep process. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in using that. And the young people we're working with want to create a few tracks about self-care and, and, you know, like holding, I mean, what was the one guy saying? Like holding elbows, you know, like locking elbows in. And they want to do this more, more specifically. We also have some people in the group interested in using fashion design to communicate messages. And there's a beautiful human called Ishmael. His name is Index Finger. Um, he's amazing. And he developed this beautiful concept called In My Feels. Uh, a lot of us don't know how to speak about mental health or the trauma we face every day. And I'm going to say, especially the women of South Africa, um, all of us men cannot understand what it's be like to be a woman or intersex or trans person. And Ishmael has created this a clothing line where you could wear what you feel if you struggle to speak about um, m m most people of color are not socialized into speaking about your emotions. Big generalization, but I firmly believe so myself included. And then the next question was, do you consider yourself more as an artist or designer? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. So I've been consciously trying to lose a little bit of traction in the research world and to, to, to actively more focus on, I'm not ready to call myself an artist, but, but I love the idea of working in creative alchemy. So I sort of considered collaborative alchemy when different people come to the same table. We don't know what we're gonna create, but something beautiful will come of that. So I think I would steer more toward conceptual artist or conceptual designer, but never alone. So I choose never to work alone. I choose always to work in in, in collab with others. I think uh, that's the end of the questions. Um, Nabil, thank you so much for, for all the content, for the information, for the knowledge, for the sharing. Um, I've dropped some links for Jitsfunga and, and uh, Index Finger as well um, in the chat. Um, I have a guy uh, connect with Nabil, I'm sure. Uh, there's his, he does, there's no Twitter, but Gmail and email. Um, yeah. So, could I mention one more thing? Nabil. Yes. Could I, um, so, sorry, Iggy. So, we, we've just created a new studio in Kenilworth. We, we mainly run workshops and, and we sell paint. Um, but we welcome uh, if people need a space to work. Let's say a few of you want to run a workshop or you want to come together and you, you don't have a space. Um, as long as you're working in a sense of working together as a community, even if it's a few of you wanting to share ideas in person, we would welcome the space to you if you plan that ahead of time because we don't want to be exclusive. So uh, I just wanted to leave that with the group. If, if, as long as you're not making money from it, we welcome you using the space at no cost.